Okay, hi everyone. Um, so this is the, uh, the uh, lectures in honor of Rao Bhatt, and uh, today and uh, Thursday we have two lectures. Uh, we have the uh, great honor of Maggie Miller from University of Texas at Austin giving the lectures, and uh, my, uh, I think Rao Bhatt would be uh, extremely pleased to be sitting here listening to these lectures. So, uh, uh, the title of this lecture is um, uh, Fibered Ribbon Knots in a Poincaré Conjecture, and then Thursday's lecture is Fibered Knots in the Slice Ribbon Conjecture. Maggie is also giving a talk tomorrow in the Open Neighborhood Seminar at 4.30 in room 507, which will be, I think, probably a more elementary talk. Uh, anyway, um, so Maggie, in my opinion, is one of the m most creative mathematicians on the planet, and I think maybe you'll agree with me after you hear her talk. And um, yeah, so, oh, one other announcement. Uh, after the talk, there's a kind of dinner reception upstairs in the math lounge. Uh, people want to talk to Maggie uh, more. Uh, informally about mathematics. Okay, so Maggie, you're on. Okay, thank you. Oh, yeah, it's working. Um, okay, so when I was deciding what to talk about, uh, my thought process was it needs to be relatively general. You're not, you're not all topologists, right? Raise your hand if you're not studying topology. Okay, and now if you're studying homotopy theory also, yes? Okay, so great, a lot of you. Um, so I wanted to keep it relatively general. Um, but I didn't want to say like what I actually work on, which is surfaces and four manifolds, because that's too vague. It needed to be like slightly more specific. So I thought it would be fun to talk about a theme that has been present in, in almost all of my projects for the last several years, which is uh, somehow this relationship between a three-dimensional concept, the definition of a fibered knot, which I'll talk about, um, and how it is surprisingly related to really big open problems in four-dimensional topology. So the stuff that I'll talk about on Thursday is more recent than what I'll talk about today, which is sort of several years ago. Um, so we're, we're working our way up. And I'm going to tell you, uh, well, just an overview of some open questions in four manifolds that you may or may not be aware of. Probably at the beginning, yes, and towards the end, no. Uh, and the relationship to fiber knots. So um, let me begin by writing an open problem that I am sure everybody knows. Uh, which is the one that's in the title, the Poincaré conjecture. So open problem. Um, in fact, it seems like calling it an open problem is a little bit makes it sound like this is an exercise, and it's not an exercise. But it is technically an open problem if uh, a four manifold, so x4, uh, just a nice closed four manifold, is, and I'm going to write it this way. I'll say homeomorphic to S4, uh, and this is smooth, then is it diffeomorphic to S4? OK, so I'm cheating a little bit right at the beginning. The Poincaré conjecture actually asks if I have a smooth four manifold, which is homotopy equivalent to S4, must it be diffeomorphic to S4? But in fact, we know that such a manifold is homeomorphic to S4 by something that Friedman did in the late 1980s. But everything in this talk is smooth, so he doesn't exist right now. Um, and this is all fine. OK. Um, so this is a really big open problem. Oh. oh, wait, there's a switch for that. We don't have that at home. This is like a fancy Harvard thing. <laughs> OK, um, so something to note is that if, uh, and this kind of object we'd be called an exotic four sphere. So in this context, exotic always means something that is true topologically, but not smoothly. So when we say a four manifold is an exotic four sphere, we mean topologically, so homeomorphic to S4, but not smoothly S4. Um, if an exotic four sphere, uh, let's say like x, exists, well then you could also consider, let's take x and just delete like a small open four ball anywhere inside x, doesn't matter. And the result um, will be homeomorphic to the four ball, but not diffeomorphic to the four ball. So this is an exotic b4. 
So you could ask the Poincaré conjecture, is there an exotic S4? You could also ask the relative version of the Poincaré conjecture, uh, is there an exotic B4? We see that the closed Poincaré conjecture, um, if, if false, implies that the relative one is false, uh, but it doesn't actually go the other way around. Because here's another open problem. Wait, is there another one? No, OK. Which again, um, feels like a little bit disingenuous to just call this open problem and not really old conjecture. But the Schoenfeld's conjecture, which at least this specific version of the Schoenfeld's conjecture, uh, if I have an S3 smoothly embedded inside of S4, uh, must it bound, or I'll say, I'll say it this way, does it cut S4 into two uh, standard four balls? Uh, so if I have a three sphere smoothly embedded in S4, of course it cuts S4, its complement in S4 is two uh, manifolds with boundary S3, um, but it's not clear whether or not they have to be diffeomorphic to B4, we just know they're homeomorphic to B4. Um, so if the Schoenfeld's conjecture, if the answer is yes, it always does this, uh, and there's an exotic four ball, then there would be an exotic four sphere. So we have some sort of like equivalence between some versions of these three problems. <laughs> okay. Um, so let me tell you about something unrelated, seemingly, uh, which is we're going to need two key definitions for me to tell you one of my favorite theorems in topology. I would call it my favorite theorem, but I'm already on the record as having stated two others, so we're going to see the third best theorem in topology. Um, so in order to understand it, we'll have to understand two key definitions, one three-dimensional, one four-dimensional. Three is always strictly easier. So um, definition a knot in S3 is fiber, uh, and I'll call this like K, uh, if S3 minus the neighborhood of K uh, is a total space of a vibration over S1, where the fibers are surfaces whose boundary is a copy of our knot, um, which we usually call a cipher surface. Uh, I'll give you an example. I think if you ever see this talk, uh, this talk, this theorem, in a, this theorem, this definition in a talk, they'll give you two examples. One is trivial and one is bad. So I'll give you the trivial one. Um, how about I put this up? OK, so the trivial example is the unknot is a fibered knot. I don't know why I drew it at an angle. Just for style. Oh, oh no. OK, so the unknot is a fibered knot. Uh, so this is supposed to be the unknotted circle, but I've just had some depth perception or something. OK, um, so that's a circle sitting inside of S3. It's the unknot because it clearly bounds a smooth disk. Uh, whenever I have an unknot in S3, um, the complement of this unknot is uh, D2 cross S1. So if you're studying topology, this is an exercise you did at some point earlier in graduate school. If you didn't study topology, you've never thought about this before. Um, that's OK. Uh, but maybe it's clear, maybe it's not. You're about to see why. First of all, if we accept that this is true, clearly this complement does fiber over S1, because it's literally D2 cross S1. Um, now let's see that it's D2 cross S1. Uh, we just need to like, see these D2s filling up the complement of this unknot. Well, here's one disk. OK, so like literally this flat disk. And I need a, a circle's worth of disks, like a one parameter family of disks. So what I'm going to do as that parameter increases is I'm going to allow my disk to just bubble up a little bit, like an upside down bowl getting less and less shallow over time. OK, so maybe that's one disk. Here's another disk. Uh, how many colors do I have? Here's another one. OK, and I'm drawing my picture as if I'm in R3. Right? But I'm talking about S3. S3 has a point of infinity. So at some point, the like, depth of these disks, as bulls, is going to be so large that there will be one disk that actually goes through the point at infinity in some finite time. And right after that, it'll come out on the other side and be close to infinity from the opposite side of R3. OK, and then maybe you can see how to fill in the rest of R3. Just is that in our one parameter, get closer and closer to this flat one. 
OK, so I filled up the complement with a bunch of disjoint disks. Uh, the boundaries of these disks, if I were to like, actually thicken this knot, they would all be parallel copies of my unknot. Um, and I can really see explicitly that there's a circle's worth of them. Because here's the circle. It's like this was one disk, here's one, here's one, going around this circle. So that's a section of the fibration. OK. Um, so the unknot is fibered. Um, unfortunately, most knots aren't fibered. Uh, so the unknot, as usual, is a special example. But it's not that special. There are infinitely many fibered knots, um, even though the average one is not. Uh, and people understand this really well. We know how to decide if a knot is fibered through, e.g., uh, knot floor homology. That can detect fiberness of knots, thanks to uh, Heaney, Palagogini. Um, we also are very good at given a, a surface whose boundary is the knot deciding if it's a fibered through lots of papers from the 1980s by Dave Goodbye. OK, so this is something that we understand well. Uh, and in particular, when this is true, then, well, that means that the complement of my knot, I, I could rewrite it as um, a surface. So this is going to be the actual surface that's the fiber. So our complement is a surface cross, well, generally not S1, um, but I, uh, and then with the ends glued together. Uh, so I'll glue together uh, a point at time 1 with some other point at time 0 according to a self-automorphism of this surface that has boundary. OK? So phi restricted to the boundary is the identity map. OK. So this map phi is called the monodromy of uh, my knot. And this is also not a mysterious object. Uh, if you handed me a fiber knot, I think I personally could actually figure out what the monodromy is, but there's people who are better than me at doing that. That's something we understand as a field. OK. No. No. Great. Um, so here's definition two, which is going to seem like it is unrelated. OK? Um, so definition. Uh, first, I'm going to give a less restrictive definition, and then I'm going to give a more restrictive definition. Uh, so definition, a knot uh, K in S3 is slice. And so again, everything in this talk is smooth. So I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to say anything that's not smooth. Everything's smooth. Uh, if it bounds a smooth disk embedded in B4. Is this too dark? Can you like see this line? Nah, maybe. OK. Um, well, it's going down anyway. A knot K in S3 is slice if it bounds a disk in B4. Uh, so um, again, if you see anybody give this definition in a talk, they will give you one example, but it's acceptable. So here's an example. The example. Um, so the, the trivial example is the unknot, actually. The unknot bounds a disk in S3. So you could just push the interior of that into B4. That's a slice disk. Um, but here's a more interesting example, which is the usual one. Uh, we'll see some other ones. Uh, OK, so here is a knot, K. Um, I just claim that this isn't the unknot. If you know any knot invariant, I think you could probably prove that this isn't the unknot. Um, if you don't know any knot invariants, then you don't care about this anyway. Um, but this, this isn't the unknot. Um, but it does bound a disk uh, smoothly embedded in B4. It does not bound a disk embedded in S3, because then it would be the unknot. So here's the disk. First, I'm going to draw something in S3, which is immersed, not embedded. Uh, so there's the reason I've drawn the knot in this like sort of very symmetric way is to make it really clear that it bounds an immersed object, actually an immersed disk. So see, my immersed disk is made by I had a small disk here, and then I stretched out like the edge of it, and then eventually I had another disk over here, like hooked itself. So this is this is a, the image of some immersion of the disk into S3, and it intersects itself in the image in these two arcs. Can anybody see that? Can everybody see that? OK. No. Um, so this is, this is not an embedding in S3. But remember, I have a whole B4's worth of freedom. So right now, schematically, 
I have S3 as the boundary of B4. I have my knot sitting here. And I have this immersed object kind of all in the boundary. Okay. What I could do is take a subregion or multiple subregions of this uh, green immersed disk. So I'm specifically going to take these two small orange subdisks, uh, which note these contain the two arcs of intersection. Uh, but like this subdisk contains one copy of this yellow arc, but not the copy that's on this like vertical strip. So it contains the arc, but just, just once. And I'm just going to push these regions a little bit deeper into the fourth dimension. So I'll have something that looks like this. I'll have part in the boundary, and then these orange regions that I pushed deeper like this. Okay. And I could perturb this just a little bit to have something that's actually properly embedded. Usually when we embed something, like in a manifold with boundary, I, I kind of only want the boundary of this surface to go to the boundary of the four ball. I don't really like how weird this looks. But that's, that's a non-issue. So I'll just perturb this a little bit to push all those green regions a little bit deeper. And I'll get something properly embedded. OK, so this thing is actually embedded. Because where before I had an intersection, well, now I'll think of this color as representing the fourth dimension. Points that are orange are deeper in the four ball than points that are green. OK, so it looks like we would have an intersection here at this sheet, this, this yellow arc. But actually, where I have a point on this yellow arc, it has one orange preimage and one green preimage. So in the four ball, those are not actually at the same point. The orange one is deeper than the green one. Okay. Um, so this is a nice embedded disk. Uh, and this is an example of a non-trivial slice knot. And so again, the average knot is not slice. Um, people spend a lot of effort. You might hear something like, oh, it's really hard to tell if a knot is slice. That's not true. It's actually usually really easy to tell if a knot isn't slice, because it's usually not slice. And it's usually like the first divariate you compute tells you that it's not slice. You have to work really hard to come up with a knot where it is really hard to tell. Um, but, but there are some where it's hard. But on average, pretty easy to show that knots aren't slice. Okay. We can do a little bit better, though. This example suggests a more restrictive uh, definition. Yeah, I did these boards totally backwards. I should have, should have had the, the deeper one on the top. But that didn't occur to me at the time. Um, I guess we don't care about the Poincaré conjecture, so. I mean, we're not going to answer that. OK. So here's the more restrictive definition, which is that a knot in S3, uh, K, is ribbon. Uh, if k is the boundary of a disk uh, properly embedded in B4 smoothly, such that additionally, so already k is slice, but additionally, when I look at radial height, so this is radial height uh, on B4. So this is the function uh, which maps the boundary of the four ball to 1, the center of the four ball to 0, and it's, this, you know, it's the radius. Uh, I want this to restrict to the disk as a Morse function with no local maxima, uh, which is to say I should have points in the disk that are locally deeper in the four ball than other points. Like here, the centers of these two orange disks, well, the orange disks were pushed deeper in the four ball, so they're deeper than the nearby points. Those are local minima with respect to radial height. But I just don't want to allow local maxima. So schematically, you should think the average slice disk in B4 will look something like, well, I have some boundary. And then I just have like a crazy embedding. It's smooth. But with respect to radial height, it's not particularly nice at all. There's points which are locally like closest to boundary and points which are locally furthest from the boundary. Um, whereas ribbon. We have this additional structure where we have points that are deeper 
and then that's it. There's saddle points. There's no, nothing that's locally closest to boundary. Okay, so actually, this example that I give you is not just a slice knot, it's a ribbon knot. Um, and that's, that's typical. It would be very difficult for me to give you an example of a slice knot that is not a ribbon knot. Um, and that's, that's the conjecture that we're going to talk about on Thursday, so I'm not going to write it on the board. Um, but now you know the two definitions. And then there, there's one more thing that I need to tell you before I can tell you the third, the third best theorem, which is that, uh, well, I, I did mention that this had some relationship to the Poincaré conjecture. So let's pretend for a minute that we believe the Poincaré conjecture is false, which we do. It's clearly false. Um, so there's, there's probably a Homotopy 4 ball, which is non-standard. Maybe. I don't know. Um, if you were going to study knots uh, bounding disks into four manifolds, like why restrict yourself to standard B4? You could consider knots bounding disks in an exotic B4, or, or really any four manifold, but I guess I could see some homotopy reason that you might prefer things to be simply connected and no homology. But homotopy four ball could be just as good. And in fact, it totally makes sense to talk about a knot k and s3 being slice into any four manifold. Because we could talk about k bounding a disk into just whatever four manifold we want. That's fine. But this ribbon definition is really restrictive. Oh. And so what we could do and say, well, what should we define? What is the analog of ribbon into a homotopy four ball? Okay, so now I'm talking about some other definition, um, which I will cleverly define to be homotopy ribbon. And by me, I mean um, probably Cameron Gordon in the 80s or 90s. Um, but now I want to consider some four manifold, which is a homotopy V4. And I have my knot on the boundary. And I need some restriction on the kind of disk that I'm going to consider, which is somehow motivated from uh, the way that we defined ribbon. Now, the issue is that we defined ribbon using a Morse function. We had a standard radial Morse function on the four ball. Like, there's like a particular one that we like. Without telling you what this four manifold is, I don't see any way you could possibly have a favorite Morse function. And even if you knew everything about this four manifold, like, I don't think that it would have like a best Morse function. Um, so this is not very natural. Um, so instead, what we do is understand what are the algebraic properties. Like, we're looking at a four manifold with the same algebraic topology as before, so we should look at what is the algebraic topology of, uh, well, this disk in the four ball, by which I mostly mean the complement of the disk in the four ball, because that's the usual thing that we would do in low dimensional topology to study a sub manifold. So here's an observation of Gordon. Uh, I think 1990s, that if you look at the fundamental group in the boundary, uh, so S3 minus the knot, this actually surjects under inclusion onto the fundamental group of B4 minus a ribbon disk. Okay. Um, so maybe you could find this plausible if I point out, like, let's, let's, uh, I'm studying this fundamental group mapped under inclusion. So here, clearly, I want to take the base point to be in this S3 minus K. Uh, so if I have a ribbon disk, I have a base point in the boundary. Uh, well, the complement of this disk, because the four ball is simply connected, the complement fundamental group is going to be generated uh, by generators represented by loops which just start at this base point and come link the disk once and then return to the base point. It's called meridians. And because this ribbon disk doesn't have any local maxima, the radial height function, if I take the gradient flow um, oriented so that it flows up towards the boundary, I could just flow this meridian, it's centered about a point on this disk, up until eventually I got to the boundary. And because there's no local maxima on this disk, I'll never get stuck. So I can always homotope this meridian, which links the disk somewhere in the interior of the manifold. 
to a meridian which is contained inside of this S3 and just comes and links the knot. Okay. So that tells me that every generator of this fundamental group is in the image uh, of this fundamental group under inclusion. Now that's, that's not how Cameron Gordon said it. He said something um, much more convincing about three manifold groups. Um, but this is like easier to draw a picture of in a talk where like I'm not going to write a theorem about three manifold groups in front of you all. Um, and I think that, that makes more sense at a, in 20 seconds. Great. So this property, um, we don't really need this to be B4 at all. Like no matter what four manifold we're talking about, we're just looking at groups. This makes sense as a surjection. So homotopy ribbon should mean that I have a disk bounded by my knot into some V4, which is a homotopy four ball. Uh, and this disk pi has the property that pi one of S3 minus K surjects under inclusion to pi one of V minus D. Okay. Cool. So those are the key definitions. Now I'm going to tell you a theorem that I thought was really surprising the first time I saw it. I guess I still do. Wait, no, I'm going to be smart about this. I want the, that board to be on the top eventually, which means I want to be writing on it now. Yeah, we don't want the slice definition anymore. We can lose that. OK. OK, so here's a theorem. I think this is 1983, Cass and Gordon. It's not actually my third favorite theorem, just in case Cameron Gordon sees this. I, that was a joke. It's, it's really good. Um, so uh, theorem 1983, Cass and Gordon. They showed that if, uh, if K, so let K be a fibered uh, slice, no, just a fibered knot in S3, then K is a homotopy ribbon if and only if its monodromy phi extends over a handle body. Uh, by here, hereby extends over a handle body. Uh, what I mean is, well, this map phi, remember this is a self-automorphism of some surface with a boundary component, our ciphered surface, phi. But it is specifically the identity on the boundary. So I could, I'll use some notation, cap this off with a disk, extend phi as the identity over the disk part, and get a new automorphism of a closed surface, which I, I'll still call phi, because I'm lazy. Uh, and now that I have this closed surface, when I say it extends over a handle body, I mean that I can find some solid of genus G with a self-automorphism where on the boundary the self-automorphism is phi. Okay. Um, so I, I thought this theorem was really surprising the first time I saw it. Because fiber knots in S3, I mean, this is a four-dimensional, three, this is a three-dimensional definition. A knot being fibered to me doesn't sound like it has anything to do with anything four-dimensional. Um, whereas this homotopy ribbon, or just, just straight up ribbon, are like clearly four-dimensional definitions. Uh, and like, why is the Poincaré conjecture involved? That's weird. Um, and this extends over a handle body. In principle, there is an algorithm to decide whether or not a given surface automorphism extends over a handle body uh, in a paper by Kassin and Long from the next year. So in, in principle, you could actually decide whether this is true and decide whether a given fibered knot is homotopy ribbon. I say in principle because I can't do the algorithm, but somebody can. Um, uh, so I, I think this is a really great theorem. And here's a consequence of it. So now I could put this at the top. Okay, so I'm going to try to like leave that up there. So a consequence of that is that if for K a fiber knot, uh, 
Uh, in fact, I'll just state the one direction version. So a fibered homotopy ribbon knot. Then a K and S3K as a pair is the boundary of some homotopy four ball and a disk for K uh, such that, well, I think you would guess that I'm going to say D is homotopy ribbon, but that would be silly because K is a homotopy ribbon now. We know about the homotopy ribbon disk. That's not interesting. Um, but such that when I look at the complement, V minus a neighborhood of D, this also fibers over the circle. Um, and in fact, not only does it fiber over the circle, the fibers are handle bodies. But that's actually automatically true for homotopy reasons. Um, but we don't, we're not doing homotopy theory. So fibers over S1 with fibers handle body. OK. So uh, here's a proof of this, because the proof is like a big schematic picture from their paper, which I think is cool. Um, this is kind of like a standard thing to do. You're going to take, whoa, no, the other way around. It's like, it's like touching my head and, you know, this thing. OK, so uh, here's the construction of this V. I have to use this theorem of Cass and Gordon. So right now I know that because K is fibered and homotopy ribbon, its monodromy extends over a handle body. OK, so um, there's, there's like one four manifold that I can like get from this theorem. There's something I can get from this theorem, which is that I could consider the actual solid of genus G and take its mapping torus, take that solid torus, cross I, and glue the ends together according to phi, and get a four manifold with boundary. OK, and somehow this four manifold, uh, it's, it's somehow it existing is like coming from this theorem. Um, and in fact, I know what the boundary of this four manifold is. So this is one of those things that, again, it's either an exercise or it's not. Um, but it's the same as if I started with S3 cross I. Uh, and then I have a copy of my uh, fibered homotopy ribbon knot. OK. Oh, I guess it should be a different color. OK, so I have some fiber at home to be ribbon, not K. It's here, cross I, too. And on the right end, I'm going to attach a thickened disk. I want to attach a disk whose boundary is this knot, but I also want to get a four manifold. So I don't literally just attach a disk. I attach a disk cross D2. If you know what a handle is, it's a zero frame two handle. Um, so I attach a thickened disk D um, where the core disk is, is attached along my knot. OK. Um, so in fact, this boundary 3 manifold, uh, M3, is equal to or homeomorphic to the boundary of this 3 manifold. So it makes sense to choose some homeomorphism between these two guys and glue them. OK. And if I do that, I'll get a 4 manifold. Uh, the boundary of that four manifold is just this S3 here at the end, because I capped off this boundary component with this thing. OK, and I claim that this four manifold is V. Uh, it's actually not so hard to check that this is a homotopy four ball. Um, it's simply connected. Why? Uh, because this piece is simply connected. I had S3 cross I. And then I glued on a disk. So at the level of homotopy, this is like, you know, a, we got like a, a three sphere wedge of disk. I mean, there's no, that's, that's simply connected. Great. Um, we glued on uh, this uh, other thing, whatever. But because we understand homotopy ribbon and ribbon, tells us that when we look at the fundamental group of a knot complement, it surjects onto the fundamental group of a, a homotopy ribbon disk complement or a ribbon disk complement. Um, Let's apply that principle over here. Well, I had a surface. If I look at the boundary of this four manifold, I have a surface as a fiber um, fibering over S1. That's what that three manifold is. When I say M3, what I really mean is it's sigma, the surface, cross I. And then I glued the ends together just like before. Okay. 
Well, the fundamental group of this surface, here it looks like it's genus 2, certainly surjects onto the fundamental group of the solid of the same genus, right? So there's a surjection here from the surface to the handle body and the level of fundamental group. So because pi 1 of this closed surface surjects onto pi 1 of this handle body of genus G, surface of genus G, we get a surjection from the fundamental group of the boundary of this piece, which I guess I should call like M4, to just pi 1 of M4. So what I'm telling you is that we have a simply connected manifold. I glued it to something where I glued along this boundary whose fundamental group surjects. So when I do Seifert van Kampen, well, I'm going to get one star something, but I amalgamate everything. So I just get one. Like the, the, the fact that this is trivial and it contains all of the fundamental group here just kills everything. So this is simply connected. OK, so you've got a simply connected 4-manifold. The boundary is S3. OK, it's simply connected. There's no H1. I have to check H2. Um, I'm not actually going to do that. I'll just claim that it is not very hard. There's H2 in this piece, um, but not in this piece. And you just, you just check that, again, everything cancels out. That's like a Meyer via Torres exercise. Uh, and then you're done. The boundary is S3, so when you know H1 is trivial, H3 is trivial from Poincaré duality, and then it's a, it's a homotopy 4-ball. Great. So this is our homotopy 4-ball. Um, and it contains a disk inside of it that is bounded by our knot K. Uh, I have uh, drawn it in orange. Okay. So here's the disk. We start at S, uh, the, the copy of the knot K in this S3 boundary. In this S3 cross I part, the disk just looks like knot cross I. And then I have this like thickened disk that I attach. I'll just take the core of that. Okay. Um, so that, that whole thing is just like one long disk whose boundary is k, properly embedded. And then the last thing is that I'm claiming the complement of my disk fibers over S1. Well, uh, the point is that the complement of this disk includes this M4 piece, which is clearly fibered over S1. That's how it's constructed. Uh, and I guess I also have the complement of this annulus inside of S3 cross I. Um, but this whole thing is a product. So I could strongly deformation retract everything uh, just over to the right until eventually I would see that the complement of D is actually just diffeomorphic to this piece. Um, so I'm not going to do that very carefully either. <sighs> but uh, I, I really like this uh, theorem because the weird thing to me is that I told you that K was homotopy ribbon, which means I probably like, had a homotopy ribbon or even a ribbon disk in mind. Generally, if I wanted to prove to you that a knot is ribbon, I would do that by constructing the ribbon disk. Um, so I probably have a favorite ribbon disk in mind for K inside of B4. Um, nowhere does that appear. Uh, this disk that I constructed, like, it's just totally independent of anything else I started with. I had a knot that was ribbon, and then like, just forget about that. Like, we don't care about that ribbon disk. We get a totally different one. And maybe it was even like ribbon in B4, but that doesn't matter anymore. We're just going to get a totally maybe different homotopy 4-ball. So like, here's the thing that I think is really weird. Uh, and this is a, an open problem that I've thought about a lot. So question, if I have a knot K, uh, which is the boundary of a disk, and let's say it's in B4, uh, and let's say it's ribbon, must it be the case that B4 minus the complement of this disk fibers over S1? That is, can you actually pick the specific disk uh, 
And, and I don't know if the answer to that is. Um, so just, just a side note, because I think this is funny. Uh, so it's on Zoom. I don't know if people are on Zoom. Um, but in particular, I know that like a bunch of people at, at UC Davis, like the grad students, were going to watch it. And one of them texted me and said that like Jennifer Sultans gave an introductory like pre-talk before this talk. And I hadn't written the talk yet. So I was like, I'll just do what she did and then like catch up. So I think I'm up to that point. OK. So uh, question, um, must this be fibered? All right, so uh, let me tell you what I was able to prove about this a few years ago. Um, uh, I'll give you like a vague statement and then a specific statement. Um, and I'll talk uh, a little bit about how this relates to uh, some other open things. Um, in particular, uh, I forgot, I want to tell you one more open problem that this is related to. Uh, so this is going to seem like it is not related to this question, but here's another really big open problem in topology. Uh, so this is called the Whitehead asphericity conjecture. It has its own Wikipedia page, so it is important. Um, uh, and this has been open since 1941, I think. Um, and the conjecture, uh, in general, does not really sound like a low-dimensional topology problem, so I have no idea what to do. Um, uh, and that is that if you have a connected subcomplex of an aspherical two complex, then it is also aspherical. Uh, I think this is a really funny uh, open question because it's just that's so obviously true, right? Um, and uh, the well, I, that's that's a joke. I don't. But the um, in fact, there is a proof of this theorem in uh, 1979. There was a proof of this in the Osaka uh, Journal of Math, uh, and then in 1981, there was a proof of this theorem in the Pacific Journal of Math. Uh, and then in 1985, there was a proof of this theorem in Transactions of the America, American Mathematical Society. Um, but it, it's still open. We know very little about this problem. Okay. So uh, let me state, and I, I'm totally sympathetic to like, this is, this is exactly the kind of thing that I would do. It really feels like it has to be true. Um, so the, there's a, there's a specific sub-question of this conjecture, which is more clearly related to the problem at hand. So let me point out something which we've, uh, no, come on, yes. The Davis grad students are really going to make fun of me for that later. Um, let me just erase this. So here's an observation which we, we basically already made, um, at least at the level of homotopy. So another observation, um, which is actually something that I'll talk more about on Thursday, it's more relevant to the slice ribbon conjecture, uh, is that B4 minus a ribbon disk is homotopy equivalent uh, to a, a two complex. Uh, this is even stronger than what I said before about the fundamental groups rejecting. Uh, it, it, we can get like a, not only is it homotopy equivalent, but I could tell you what the homotopy equivalence is. Um, so uh, here's roughly why that is true. If I have my B4 with a ribbon disk inside of it, okay, um, then, uh, well, Here's the homotopy, here's the two complex that this complement is homotopy equivalent to. I have one zero cell, which is at the center of the four ball. And then I will have a, a number of one cells that is equivalent to the number of local minima of this ribbon disk. Okay, and then uh, for each saddle point uh, of this disk with respect to radial height, I will have one two cell. Okay, so if you have read Gomp and Stipschitz, you know what this means. Um, but if not, this is just true. Uh, there's a homotopy equivalence to this, uh, co this, this complex. Um, and moreover, I could turn this complement into the whole four ball by just gluing this disk back in. And by that I mean, well, this is like a thickened disk that I've deleted. 
So this is, this is a little tautological, but B4 minus neighborhood of disk, union neighborhood of disk is equal to B4. I think that's not controversial. Um, and this is specifically glued uh, along a thickened circle. Uh, this disk is actually uh, maybe a little bit counterintuitive. You haven't thought about it before, but if I delete something and I want to fill it back in, uh, I'm really gluing in as like a meridian. Like I'm gluing in a disk which is uh, like a point cross D2 in my like disk cross D2. Okay. But anyway, that tells me that, well, not only is the complement, it's up to homotopy, it's a two complex. It's actually a subcomplex if I add one more two cell to something that is a homotopy four ball. Um, so uh, forget aspherical, contractible. Um, so if this whitehead asphericity conjecture were true, that would tell me that the complement of a ribbon disk would be aspherical. And there are, um, I didn't write down the years, but there's a lot of proofs of this theorem too. Um, but it is still unknown. Um, it's very tempting. Uh, OK. So one thing that's nice about, well, if, if you're not K is ribbon. Oh, and I, I realize I, I didn't write this, this. This needs to be a fiber knot here. If, if K, uh, this only makes sense if K is fibered. Uh, that's, that's right. So like a sub-question of the whitehead asphericity conjecture, like a sub-conjecture, sub I don't know to phrase this as a question or a conjecture, but um, is B4 minus the neighborhood of a ribbon disk always aspherical? And uh, I think the answer I would guess is yes. There are lots of cases. Like, if, if you give me a specific ribbon disk, I bet I could prove that it's as, if it has fi if it has fibered boundary, I bet I could prove that it's aspherical. <laughs> um, but I, I have no idea how to approach this question in general. Um, but one observation about it, when it does have fibered boundary, so I'm, I'll, I'll erase this whitehead aspherity conjecture. Oh, you're, well, I, I mean, I think the, the intuition is yes, but I don't know how to actually translate that into like a, a proof somehow. So it comes out the polynomial, and you can go right from quantum core array into the polynomial. I, I think then I, I don't know. I mean, I think what you're saying is like somehow I, at the level of like, this is, this is going to be me sounding very naive, but I think somehow at the level of homology, like I deleted a disk, that's kind of like adding a one cell. No, yes, adding a one cell. How could that have possibly, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that question, though. So as long as it's true, it's just a polynomial representation of the Riemann space. It's like a, you're building up these dimensions. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> But there, there's still room for one more. <laughs> You're building the number of terms you need to fully represent the real projective plane so that you get a Riemannian surface where there's a single path. Those are unicentric. So it's the same representation, but you need that polynomial format to get there. Because uh, otherwise, you can't represent it. I think. I think it's just so different. I don't know how to translate between these things. Sorry. <laughs> um, but let me just, uh, I'll just say, wait, what was I talking about? Um, the uh, disk is a spherical. Oh, OK, observation. Sorry. Observation. Or uh, maybe I'll phase this as like a, a, a fact or a lemma that is due to uh, Meyer Zup. No, Meyer Larson. That feels weird. <laughs> how could that move? Larson and Meyer. Uh, from the early 2010s, um, uh, based on work of Tim Cochran, that if you have a, a, a disk, if B4 minus this neighborhood of this disk uh, is fibered, then it is aspherical. Uh, because they prove that whenever you have a ribbon disk, and in fact, 
um, homotopy ribbon. Uh, its complement in B4, or V4, uh, well, if it fibers over um, S1, then the fibers have to be handle buddies. They prove that's true using some like theorems pretty specific to three manifold groups um, uh, based on work of Cochrane. And once you know the fiber is a handle body, well, that means this complement, uh, the infinite cyclic cover, is just a handle body cross R. And the, the handle body is homotopy equivalent to a one complex. So this whole thing is like a one complex. So, so it's aspherical. OK, great. Um, so somehow, if you could show that this is always true, it wouldn't prove that every ribbon disk is aspherical. It would only apply for ones with fiber boundary. And then it wouldn't solve the whole whitehead asphericity conjecture, because the average connected complex, subcomplex of an aspherical two complex doesn't have the same homotopy as like this. Uh, but it would still be progress, and I think really exciting. OK. Um, so that's one reason that I like this problem. Great. So uh, in the next, I know it's like 90 minutes, but either Crystal or Maureen said probably like leave like 20 minutes of that for like question slash discussion. So I'm just going to talk for like 10 or 15 more minutes. Um, so I'm, let me tell you a theorem, because I didn't actually tell you any, except for the Cass and Gordon one, which is pretty good. So I thought about this stuff for a while. And in particular, um, I think the first paper I wrote by myself, my thesis was about this. So theorem, um, why am I looking at this? I know what the theorem is. Uh, 2018, I gave a condition that if, uh, in this case, well, k is a fiber knot, it is the boundary of a ribbon disk in B4, a particular one, if D additionally satisfies a certain transversality condition, I'll tell you what that is, maybe. OK, so this is like some asterisk. Then the complement of D fibers over S1. Um, and I can give you a case, uh, a subcase of this asterisk, which is very easy to say, which is that um, in particular, if when we look at the, the radial height of V4 and we restrict to D, not only is this a Morse function with no local maxima, I want this to have exactly two local minima. In this case, then the theorem applies. OK, so I showed you one ribbon disk with two local minima. It was that, the only ribbon disk that I showed you. Boundary, that's not a fiber knot, so that's not a good example. But yeah. Um, so the, I was actually really happy with this two minimum uh, pr property, uh, like sub theorem, because this is actually an extension of one of my f fork, fork favorite theorem. Um, but which also, also motivates like an open question that I think is still really good, if perhaps not on the level of the whitehead asphericity conjecture. And I did say that I was working my way towards more and more specific. Uh, so here is a theorem uh, of uh, technically Charlemagne. There is a much easier paper to read by Charlemagne and Thompson from a few years later. So I think this is 1984. I shouldn't say technically. He proved this, this is, and it's a good proof, but it's easier to read the other one, um, which is that uh, if D is a ribbon disk bounded by the unknot, and H restricted to D has two local minima, then D is boundary parallel. OK, so this is actually an extension of that. Let me explain why. Um, when I say boundary parallel, I mean, well, I have the unknot sitting inside of S3, right? So the unknot bounds a disk inside of S3. I'm saying if you take any two minimum disk for this unknot inside of B4, it's smoothly isotopic uh, rel boundary to this disk uh, inside of like S3. 
Okay. Um, well, something to note about what does it mean for a disk to be boundary parallel? Uh, it means that well, the trace of this isotopy, or I'll say something even stronger. In particular, what if I actually had a three ball uh, co-bounded between this yellow ribbon disk inside of B4 and an actual disk inside of S3? Well, this, this three ball would give us the isotopy. So that tells us that if uh, D, um, which is a ribbon disk for the unknot, bounded by the unknot, has the property that its complement is fibered. Well, I know what the fiber is because it has to be a handle body because it's a ribbon disk. And it has to be a handle body um, where the boundary is a fiber for the unknot, which is a disk, plus D, so a two sphere. Well, there's only one handle body whose boundary is a two sphere, and it's, 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 uh, it's the three ball, which means that D is boundary parallel. Okay, um, and I can go backwards like even more easily. If D is boundary parallel, well, then I just like literally know what it is. It's, it's this white disk in S3, but then I could push its interior into the four ball. And so I can just check what is the complement of that. It's B3 cross S1. Which is, of course, fibered over the circle by three balls. So for the unknot, um, Checking whether or not a ribbon disk is the standard like boundary parallel one is equivalent to checking whether that ribbon disk complement is fibered by handle bodies. They're literally the same. Uh, so in particular, this theorem would tell us that if D ha had boundary the unknot and two minima, then it's fibered, so it's, it's, it's boundary parallel. Now, this is not like a reproof of this theorem because I, I, I actually use Charlemagne's work in this theorem. So I'm certainly not like recovering it in a new way. I'm just using something about this technique uh, to extend the theorem to uh, arbitrary fibered ribbon knots. Okay. And here's the open problem, which I think is natural given the Charlemagne theorem and something that I really wanted to prove and was the direction that I was trying to go. So here's another question. How many ribbon disks uh, does the unknot bound in B4? And let's say up to smooth isotopy rail boundary. And I think I would conjecture that maybe there's only one. Um, certainly, like there's, there's no, like if we only consider disks with one or two minima, then those are all isotopic, smoothly, rel boundary. That's what Charlemagne did. But maybe there's some crazy, like three minimum ribbon disk for the unknot that's just not boundary parallel. Um, I don't know how to handle that. And I think a lot of people have thought about this problem. You can rephrase this as a three dimensional sounding problem. Uh, and then it's very relevant to several of Charlemagne's papers. So I, I'm sure that he's thought about this quite a bit. So I really wanted to, to actually like answer this question. Um, and I was trying to use the vibration on the complement of the, the knot in S3, like take an arbitrary ribbon disk, and I was going to project it to S3, and then something, and then that would be the proof. I just didn't figure out what that something step was. Uh, so instead, I realized that, well, at least the two minimum argument sort of still works no matter what the vibration is on the boundary. Um, so I can do that. So I'll tell you what the transversality condition is, which might give you an idea of how to prove this theorem. Um, no, I like, it's just, this is just easier. This is fine. OK, so the uh, condition um, in, in involves us uh, having a different understanding of how I might present a ribbon disk. Uh, a ribbon disk is obtained starting from its boundary. some fibered ribbon knot inside of S3, and giving, giving a collection of, of what I'll call bands 
which are just rectangles properly embedded in the knot complement, where two opposite edges are on the knot, and the other two are not not on the knot. OK? So, and I want my collection of vans to have the property that when I do surgery to my knot along all of the vans, I get an unlink. So you can tell that that's true in this example, even if you don't know what surgery means. I feel like you guess. Um, it means that uh, if I just delete where that band intersects the knot and replace that intersection with the other two edges of the band, I'll get some new link. And I want it to be an unlink. Um, so can everybody tell that this is an unlink? Um, if, you, if you can't tell this is an unlink, then you must have been very confused at some of the other stuff that I drew. Um, so I hope that is OK. Um, so this actually presents a specific ribbon disk up to smooth isotopy in the four ball. It's built by starting with this as the boundary, um, extending that as a collar deeper into the four ball. So I'll just draw schematically. And then I'll have one cross section, which actually contains a copy of this band. And then just below that, have this resolved where I've done the surgery link. And because it is specifically the unlink, I can then fill this in with disks in one cross section. Okay, so this is just a schematic. You can see I've drawn something that's rectilinear. Um, but I could smooth out the corners and get that this is a smooth disk in B4 with local minima. And it will have a saddle point for each one of these bands. Okay. So with this understanding of ribbon disks, the property that I want is that when I look at the core arcs of all these bands, I just think of them as like thickened arcs, where the arcs are properly embedded in the knot complement. So uh, I guess I'll erase my asterisk. OK. D is determined by bands about arcs, maybe a bunch of them, in the uh, unknot complement, oh, sorry, in the knot complement. I want these arcs to all be, at the same time, transverse to the fibration, so to the leaves or the fibers of the fibration. OK. Um, that seems bad, I guess. But if you've thought about like constructing fibrations or foliations, it's like, I feel like this went, I don't know. You either have a guess or you don't. Um, it's like, uh, it's just a very explicit paper of like, OK, I've assumed something so that I have a local model of what the fibration looks like near these bands, which somehow contain all of the information about this ribbon disk. And now I'm just going to do it. Like, here's the extension, like, like four, four figures, you know. Um, really good ones, though. OK. Um, and then you have to be, I am, you have to be careful uh, to make sure everything's smooth. But, but that, that's something that we know how to do. OK. <sighs> OK, um, so this seems bad. Um, but in particular, it does include this two local minimum case uh, in, in a really nice way because of this. And I'll cite the other version, a more general statement by Charlemagne and Thompson, number five, 1989. Uh, they showed that if you have a not K, any knot, nothing about being fibered, just a knot, or even a, even a link. If I have a link, L, and I do this band surgery, respecting orientations, to get some other link, uh, and I decrease the complexity of a minimum cipher surface. So uh, decreasing, well, I'm going to say increasing Euler characteristic of a uh, max Euler characteristic Seifert surface. OK, so it, it's Euler characteristic. You know, so like usually it's, it's, when it's complicated, it's really negative. So when it increases, it actually gets simpler. I'll give an example. Then the band actually lies up to isotopy in a max Euler characteristic surface uh, for our starting link L. OK, so if we take a look at, um, well, this, this particular example that I've drawn, 
Let's say L is this knot, which is called the square knot. And I've given you a band, a single band, because I'm determining a ribbon disk with two minima, one saddle point. So one band. And I know that that band surgery gives me the unlink. OK, so the unlink bounds a really simple ciphered surface, two disks, um, or the characteristic two. Uh, there is no way that our knot bounds a surface of Euler characteristic two or greater, because that's just like literally impossible. It's an oriented surface with one boundary component. So that means this is true in this example. And that means that this band specifically lies inside of a fiber in the complement of L. So this is a picture of a genus two ciphered surface for this link, this knot. Um, which actually contains this whole band. And you might think, well, the band literally lying inside a fiber sounds like the opposite of being transverse to the fibers. And you would be wrong. That's the good case. Uh, because, I'm sorry, that was really aggressive. Um, <laughs> because if we take like a profile view of this band, well, so here's like two strands of my knot sort of coming straight out of the board. And I'm just seeing the band like just from the side, so it looks like a line. And right now it's contained inside of this fiber, which means the nearby fibers just look like pushed off copies. Then I can perturb the band. I'll just isotope it just a little bit, fixing the boundary, still defining the same disk, so that it twists around once. Like, I feel like this is like a usual trick somehow. Uh, one of those like keychains. OK. And now it's actually transverse to the vibration. All right, so I've improved this a little bit since then. I know this is like a really old theorem. It's, I'm working my way more recent. On Thursday, I'm going to tell you something that I did four years ago and then something that I did two years ago. So we're like almost caught up. You have no idea what I'm doing right now. Um, but uh, last year, I did show that I could improve this star a little bit in a way that I was like really mad about. Um, so 2023, it's actually OK if uh, all the gamma are not, not transverse to the fibers with at most one tangency to the fibers on each gamma i. And I was mad about that because, I don't know, somehow the difference between transverse to one tangency is so huge that I just assumed that like then any number would be OK. But that is, no, I don't know what to do with two tangencies. Um, OK, so that was the 70 minutes. I said I would do 70 plus 20. So I said a theorem. So maybe now we do the 20. Yeah, OK. The question was something, something on not bounding ribbon disks. So, yeah. so, you, so you mentioned uh, the question of how many ribbon disks does the unknot bound? Yeah. Uh, is that the same question or a different question as asking how many ribbon concordances there are from the unknot to itself? Oh, um, that is that the same question? I think that's the same question, unless there's something weird about boundary. I bet it's the same question, but if you told me that I'm not noticing something about boundary and you seemed really confident that I would believe you. No, I, <laughs> yeah, I just, I thought that it was, would follow from Gordon's work on ribbon concordance that there's only one ribbon concordance from the unknot to itself. No, so but, uh, Gordon proved something about um, a, a, a partial ordering. Uh, there is a conjecture about partial ordering, which was um, uh, proved by Ian Agle recently. Uh, but that doesn't actually study the specific concordance. Like the fact that you have a ribbon concordance from the unknot to the unknot tells you, oh, then there's an injection on one end from the unknot complement group into this concordance complement group, fundamental group, and then a surjection on the other end. So you know the fundamental group of the complement of the concordance is Z, but then I don't, like, that, that's it. Yeah, there, there's a lemma. I'll ask about it later, though. OK. Maybe. But it is a really good question. You could study concordances rather than disks. And then we, we, there are more specific statements about concordances that can be interesting when it's, the unknot isn't involved. Uh, yeah. Yeah, question up there. 
Hi, thanks for that great talk. I want to go back to about minute 20 when you were discussing uh, the great um, Cass and Gordon theorem ah. about um, fiber knots where the monodromy extends to a handle body. Yeah. And you were getting potentially fake four cells from that. That's right. And I thought you were going to go in the direction of connecting that to the question of possibly constructing fake four cells via that oh. method. I wondered if you could elaborate Th that's on right. that idea. I, I should have maybe said this explicitly, like one strategy for disproving the Poincaré conjecture, or at least the relative version, would be then to find a fiber ribbon or homotopy ribbon knot and somehow prove that it doesn't bound any fibered homotopy ribbon disk into the four ball. And then you would know that there is a, uh, a, a non-standard homotopy four ball. Um, and I think that is also really interesting, but somehow to me it seems like that would involve understanding all of the homotopy ribbon disks bounded by a knot. I mean, not necessarily, but maybe, but we can't even do that for the unknot. So I, I, don't, I don't know what to do. Um, no, and it's, it is a really good question. If you read through the Cass and Gordon argument, you can like pick out like a little bit. It's, it's not just there is an extension. They construct the extension. So you can figure out like a little bit about what the homotopy four ball is. And people understand, or people study whether the specific ones according to specific extensions are diffeomorphic to the four ball. I think Jeff Meyer and Alex Zupan, that sounds much more natural when it's the two of them together, um, have a, a, a paper showing that many of them are standard. I have an aim square, which is supposed to be about proving that they're standard, but we kind of haven't talked about that very much. Um, that's just the title of the aim square. But it is a very interesting problem. <laughs> Uh, thanks, and if, if I can just follow up with one little question. So if one were to start from the perspective of the handle body subgroup of the mapping class group, can one tell which elements of that group um, are monodromies of knots, i.e., once you construct the three-manifold that fibers over the circle, if it has a Dane filling, which is actually the three-sphere? Oh, uh, I, I'm not sure. I, I think maybe uh, the, well, because you could tell if it's a homology circle or not, and you could compute the fundamental group, and we know which groups are not complement groups. Um, so, and then I think those two things together I, I think that they would imply that it is actually the not complement group, unless there's like a weird peripheral subgroup thing that I don't know about, but it's, it has boundaries, so it's probably fine. Um, but uh, yeah, in principle, I think you should be able to decide. Yeah. Yeah. If you had a dollar to bet, would you bet the point query conjecture is true or false? Oh, false, definitely. Except I said that at a conference, and Dave Goodbye said maybe he thinks it's true, and I then maybe it's true, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but he, I think he was just being controversial. <laughs> so when I'm talking about the sliced ribbon conjecture on Thursday, there is a thousand dollar bet. I'm not involved. I just know about it, but I always advertise that on the sliced ribbon conjecture. So people, people put money. <laughs> Any more questions? Well, people can ask privately. We, as I said, there's a reception upstairs on the fourth floor in the math department in the common room. And if you don't know where that is, just follow people upstairs. Okay. Thank you again. A anyway, she's going to talk tomorrow, 4.30, in room 507, and then the second bot lecture Thursday here at 4 o'clock. <laughs>